Thank you very much for coming out to hear about our project. So it's a great pleasure to um, get to share a little bit with you this uh, really extraordinary project that um, I've been privileged to be a part of over the last several months, which is uh, variously titled uh, Exploring Empire, um, uh, Thinking Through the Entangled Histories of Empire at a Global University. And what I'd like to do is just in a few moments talk to you about the origins of the project and uh, its motivation, kind of its, its intellectual reasons for being. And then I'll hand over to my colleague Manu to explain more of the exciting stuff that we've started to find. Uh, and I urge you all, if you haven't yet, to go and visit us in that, in that corner of the Great Hall where there's a, an abundance of archival material to, to look at. So in explaining what this project is about, I want to start with a quotation um, from Jeanette Winterson's 1985 book, Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit. And in this section, she is uh, talking about um, what history is for and what history does. And when I read this quote, I taught this book um, a few weeks ago in another one of my modules. And when I read this, I thought, this is, this is what we're doing. This is what we're all about in this project. So she says, history should be a hammock for swinging and a game for playing the way cats play. Claw it, chew it, rearrange it, and at bedtime it's still a ball of string full of knots. Nobody should mind. People like to separate storytelling, which is not history, from fact, which is history. They do this so that they know what to believe and what not to believe. This is very curious. How is it that no one will believe that the whale swallowed Jonah when every day Jonah is swallowing the whale? I can see them now stuffing down the fishiest of fishtails. And why? Because it is history. Knowing what to believe had its advantages. It built an empire and kept people where they belonged in the bright realm of the wallet. Very often, history is a means of denying the past. So when I read that, I thought, exactly, that's exactly what we don't want to do. That's exactly what we in, uh, in this project are trying to do differently, to think about what it means to have a history of our institution that isn't about telling the past that keeps us where we belong, or thinking about what happened here in a way that makes us, uh, gives us a, a neat story that we can, that we can swallow, uh, like the fishiest of fish tales. Um, instead, this is a project about thinking how we might live with our past, how we might confront all the complexities of our past, how we might recognize all the diversity of our collective stories, even if at the end of the day we're still left with a tangled skein. So the project grew first out of a very simple question, which was, um, what difference does the Commonwealth make to the University of Birmingham? What does the Commonwealth matter to us? And then quickly it became a different kind of question, which was, how do we understand the University of Birmingham as a global university? And if we understand it that way, then how do we also understand it as an imperial institution? And I think it's absolutely crucial that we ask those questions. Um, we describe ourselves as a global university. Rightly, we describe ourselves as a global university. And indeed, the University of Birmingham has always been a global university, from its founding by Joseph Chamberlain, amongst others, uh, when he was the Secretary of State for the colonies. Um, but I think we've only begun to think historically about what that means uh, to us and what legacies we still carry as a result of that. So if you look at our main uh, history and heritage websites, on the main, the main university website, there's lots and lots of great information there about, about us and about Birmingham and about the people who founded our institution. Um, we say there that we help, have helped to make the world what it is. Uh, we don't say very much about how the world made us or where empire and colonialism might fit into that story. So this is a project about trying to ask those questions and see what other kinds of answers we might come to. In a sense, it's a project about bringing our institutional history into line with what 
um, or into the light of, of the way professional historians of, of, um, of empire and colonialism have been thinking for a long time about the relationship between empire and knowledge, uh, between empire and institutions, between imperial administration and, um, and colonial knowledge and institutions of learning. So we know, for example, that the creation of knowledge um, has been entangled in colonial projects and imperial administration around the world. We know that disciplines like anthropology and others emerged out of um, colonial contexts, colonial research projects, uh, colonial projects of knowledge. Uh, the notion of um, the production of colonial knowledge is, is one that has been fruitful for generations of scholars now. We know that ways of seeing the world, uh, systems of classification emerged out of um, the entangled presence of, of empire and colonial systems of power around the world. We know that networks of professional practice and expertise um, helped to knit the imperial project together in all sorts of ways and that universities were a key part of this so that people moving between imperial institutions um, and universities and, um, and, and businesses have been part of how uh, the global systems and imperial systems have been functioning for the last two centuries. And we know that the institutions of 19th and 20th century Britain writ large were always already imperial. We're always caught up in processes of wealth extraction, um, of wealth generation, of exchange of information, um, and so on. We have only to think of the great work of, of Catherine Hall in uh, tracing out some of the intersections between the people of Birmingham and, uh, and, and empire writ large, transatlantic slavery, and so on, to see that the university can only naturally be a part of that story. So then this project is about asking, right, how do we put the University of Birmingham into that context? How do we have an institutional history that, um, that works for us, that explains some of those stories, and that also helps us to, to navigate the institution that we live in? So as a collective, this project is a collective um, of, of a group of academics and postgraduate researchers. Um, all the hard work has been done by the postgraduate researchers, actually. One of the things that we've been doing together in our, in our regular meetings is to read our way through some other institutional histories and other examples of institutions that tried to grapple with difficult, complicated, hard histories. So we've read, for example, uh, Brown University's report on slavery, its entanglement with, with slavery. Um, and we've read uh, University College London's report on uh, its history with regard to eugenics. And it's become clear through those conversations as well as through our explorations into the university's collections just what a complicated, multifaceted, and emotional history this is. That this history is actually here all around us all the time. That everybody who moves through our, uh, through our campus encounters it in different ways and, and experiences it in different ways. So this is a project about trying to bring that to the forefront and actually talk about it uh, properly. So as I said, we've been meeting, we've been talking. The postgraduate researchers have been going into our collections and really scoping out what's there, just trying to um, identify the kinds of imperial, colonial, post-colonial, decolonial histories we might tell using what we have on campus um, and, and refining the kind of questions we might want to answer. So I'm going to hand over with that to, to Mana Segal to explain more about what it is that we found. Uh, again, I'll repeat uh, what other speakers have said in terms of thanking you for being here. Uh, but I would particularly want to thank uh, our team, um, including um, not just Mo, but also Dr. Chris Moores, uh, who has been collaborating uh, with the first of the four uh, postgraduate students I'll be talking about. Uh, it's really not very interesting to describe other people's research, uh, especially when they have made a sterling effort in terms of uh, bringing out 
uh, some of the highlights of what they have found. Uh, so I'll again repeat something that Mo said a few minutes ago, which is that if you do get an opportunity, if you haven't done so already, please make your way over to the displays that they have set up, uh, and they'll be very happy to talk to you about uh, some of the themes that I'll be raising, uh, albeit uh, briefly today. Uh, so I'll begin with uh, the work done by uh, Angeline uh, Hales Henderson, who's been working with uh, Chris Moore's uh, in uh, the Lapworth uh, Museum and its collections. Uh, for those who may not know, um, for those who are visiting us uh, uh, from out, outside of the university, we're practically standing on top of the Lapworth collection, right? It's tucked away in this building. Uh, you can make your way uh, somewhere as you exit to the left, uh, and you will find a fantastic collection of geological uh, specimens which are on display. Um, uh, there is a skeletal remain of a dinosaur, but those are the only the things that you get to see which are visible. Uh, and what we often don't appreciate is uh, the vast quantity of, of material that the Lapworth holds. Um, and uh, Angeline, for instance, has been able to uh, think with the papers of uh, John Percy uh, whose mineral specimen collection was acquired by the university uh, in 1915. Uh, some of you may have already noticed the very impressive large-scale geological maps that are on display. Uh, in addition to that, we have the papers of uh, Professor John Cadman, uh, who was a professor of mining at the university uh, in, in the beginning of the 20th century, and then went on to play a prominent role uh, in uh, the development of the petroleum industry towards the end of the Second World War. Uh, historians tend to lend a sense of neatness uh, where perhaps it never existed in the first place. So if I was to describe Angeline's work as dealing with the material, uh, the mineral, uh, the next component uh, of our team's uh, work uh, deals with the intellectual. Um, and this would be the work done by uh, Amira Ismail, uh, working in the Cadbury Research Library. So Amira has been very conscious of the fact that when we try and think with ideas as large as decolonizing the academy, uh, we should definitely be looking for radical voices, but we should be also looking for uh, institutional actors, including members of staff uh, who have left their imprint in our own collections. So with that in mind, uh, she has dug into a fairly substantial, uh, fairly voluminous collection of uh, Marion Johnson, uh, who was appointed as a uh, uh, lecturer in 1969, uh, was an honorary fellow uh, till 1988. Uh, Marion Johnson was amongst uh, four women uh, who went on to leave uh, a fairly large volume of material. Uh, and I'll have a little bit more to say about these four women uh, towards the end of my, uh, my, my presentation. Uh, Johnson's work uh, included being a reporter for the East African Standard during the Second World War. Uh, she worked at the Institute for African Studies in Ghana. Uh, this was uh, 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 work that she did before she joined the Center for West African Studies, uh, which was set up by John Fage, uh, the very person who went on to uh, set up uh, our own uh, uh, West, uh, West, what was then called the West African Studies Center at the University of Birmingham. Uh, Johnson's intellectual interests varied, uh, and they were as diverse as working on the Cambridge history of Africa, creating its index uh, to um, material culture, including baskets and, and pottery. Uh, but her real specialism, for which she really became a renowned scholar in her own rights, was to study West African currencies. Uh, and thus, a large part of the collection really deals with that one theme. Uh, again, uh, I'll put a bookmark as far as Johnson's work and her voluminous bequest to our, uh, uh, our Cadbury collection is concerned, uh, and return to her towards the very end 
as a part of a quartet of women uh, who have left their papers behind uh, as a part of our African studies material. So having dealt with uh, the material, having dealt with the intellectual, move on to the political. And this is the work being done by Savita Vij, who has been working uh, as well in the Cadbury Research Library. And this is perhaps as good a moment as any other to acknowledge the cooperation that our team has received from uh, colleagues uh, working in these institutional collections. Uh, we are fully aware of the fact that these have been strange times uh, as we emerge out of the pandemic. Uh, and we are very grateful for the cheerful uh, and generous cooperation that we have received. Uh, uh, so Savita's work uh, has focused on uh, student voices. Uh, if we are looking at institutional collections, uh, those are important actors. I mean, really can't think of a university without a, 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 a voluble uh, student body. Uh, Savita's work has focused on um, the red brick, uh, which is, for those who are familiar with it, uh, the, uh, the student uh, uh, paper, uh, which, and its predecessor, uh, the Guild News, uh, which was first published in 1936. So between 36 and 62, it's um, uh, various predecessors of the red brick. And from 1962 onwards, you have the more familiar red brick. Um, Savita has managed to uh, uncover an astonishing range of, of material. Uh, and for those who are familiar with our student body, perhaps we should not be that surprised that that range is so impressive. Um, the topics uh, covered uh, in the paper include um, politics in Ireland, uh, demands for home rule uh, in India, uh, the university's links with Rhodesia, business interests uh, that the, the UK has, uh, including those uh, with uh, apartheid South Africa, uh, the expulsion of uh, South Asians from East Africa, especially Uganda, uh, and of course, uh, students agitating over uh, the passing of race acts, um, as well as a, a very active student body which wants to register uh, its political voice in, pub in the public sphere. Uh, Savita noticed a trend that towards the late 1960s, this political agitation, uh, this political temperament uh, seems to give way ever so gradually, almost imperceptibly, to a newer way of talking about the world. Uh, increasingly, you have mention of uh, the coming of the curry house, the Indian restaurants. Uh, you have advertisements for uh, musical concerts by uh, world-renowned artists. Uh, you have posters for tourism and travel to exotic destinations. Uh, the preliminary impression seems to be that uh, the spirit of anti-colonial resistance uh, and protest uh, somewhat mutedly gives way to a sort of a more palatable celebratory uh, form of multiculturalism. Uh, I would point out that most of what we are summarizing here lends a neatness uh, to an otherwise uh, fairly uh, substantial and growing body of knowledge, uh, which we still would want to designate as uh, a part of a pilot project, uh, which is to say that this is a scoping exercise where we have um, uh, ever so lightly tried to sample the rich collections of the university. Finally, having discussed the political, uh, I would want to conclude with a few comments uh, on the cultural, the artistic. Uh, and here I would be focusing on the work done by Stacey Kennedy, who has been engaged uh, for her PhD work uh, substantially with the Danford collection. Uh, as Stacey quite uh, correctly reminds us, uh, the collection is named after John Danford, uh, who was an artist, um, an Irish uh, artist, um, uh, who had been the administrator in Western Nigeria uh, for the British Council, uh, who was awarded the OBE in 1953 for his services. Uh, he built up a very large private art collection, 
uh, most of which was purchased uh, uh, or commissioned directly from contemporary working artists. And, and Stacey quite, quite helpfully reminds us that this is quite contrary to the impression that much of the collection was part of some kind of loot, uh, which uh, there really isn't any suggestion, there no, really isn't any evidence to suggest that in the first place. The gendered aspect of Stacey's work is evident from the fact that uh, she reminds us that nearly half of what we refer to as the Danford collection uh, comprises of material donated by four women. Sister Evelyn Bellamy, uh, Eleonora Ferguson, Marion Johnson, whom we talked about uh, a few minutes ago when talking about the Cadbury Research Library, and Professor Lalash Brown. Yet, as Stacey quite lightly reminds us, the collection itself bears the name of John Danford. Uh, Stacey has been looking at uh, the work of uh, women artists uh, and has been quite in intrigued by the necessity of looking for the voices of African uh, art producers within the collection. Uh, and this has led her to uh, the work of Clara Obadaga Angu. Uh, and there's very little known about this Nigerian uh, uh, painter, uh, and that led Stacy to acknowledge that it was particularly astonishing for her to discover that for this very important yet not very well researched artist, uh, we at the university seem to have some of her artwork, uh, including as a part of the Danford collection. Uh, this is an iconic figure, Stacy reminds us, uh, who has been incredibly influential as an artist and as an educator and played a substantial role in the structural advancement of the art scene in, po in the post-colonial modernist period uh, uh, of uh, Nigeria. Uh, after its independence in 1960. So I'll just conclude with uh, this acknowledgement that uh, this is the hard work that's done by our postgraduate team. Uh, it gives you some vignettes of the richness and the range of our own institutional collections. Uh, it also gives us some impression of what could be potentially done uh, if the project was perhaps to be scaled up or perhaps if it was to be developed in many different directions. Uh, and of course, for those who are curious um, uh, and would have more questions about some of these preliminary findings, obviously we are available, especially our students who have done all the hard work in terms of compiling uh, this, this growing body of, of knowledge. Thank you.